Donnybrook is made possible by the members of the Nine Network. Thanks for joining us for Donnybrook, this edition, the 1st of June. Good to have you with us. And a little later in the broadcast, we're going to talk to the CEO and president of the Urban League of Metropolitan St. Louis, Mike McMillan, who's been kind enough to accept our invitation. But first, we'll kick around the issues of the week and what a week it was, as you know. Wendy Weiss is the news director for the Big 550 KTRS. Hello, Wendy. Along with one of our founders, Mr. Bill McClellan from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He's Ray Hartman, now writing columns for the Riverfront Times and hosting St. Louis in the know on the Big 550 KTRS weeknights at 9. And, of course, Mr. Alvin Reed, the pride of Kirkwood, Missouri, who is writing for the St. Louis American. You also hear him on 590 AM and 97.1 FM News Talk on the Dave Glover Show. Bill, we're going to start with you because uh, you are the seasoned veteran who's seen quite a few things in your reporting career, but maybe no week quite like this one. And I, I know you didn't just live through Vietnam. You were in Vietnam. You uh, were here during Watergate and then through the Iran hostages crisis, and then through 9-11, and I don't know how many recessions. But this week, with the civil unrest in, in 140 cities, about 70 buildings and businesses burned or looted in the St. Louis area, lots of nonviolent demonstrations to be sure, but all of this during the middle of an international pandemic that has already claimed more than 100,000 lives in St. Louis, so rather in the country. So maybe, can you just kind of like sum it up? Where are we right now in your estimation? Well, in, in my estimation, Charlie, things are better than they were back in 1968. And I've said that to a young person who I'm very close to, who said, when you say that, Dad, you sound like an old man. And I say, well, I am an old man. And I think that like race relations, as bad as they are right now, they're better than they were, I think, my generation was better than my parents' generation. The, our kids are better than we were. And just the fact that these demonstrations, you know, to look at the, the big picture, the thousands and thousands of people demonstrating peacefully, and their uh, people, you know, college kids, and they're old people, and they're black, and they're white. And uh, the fact that even athletes are speaking up and everything, Back in 1968, you know, when those Olympians raised their hand in the black power thing, people were outraged. And, and now uh, athletes, you know, white and black, speak out about this. And I'm not saying that things are good, but I, I think things are improving. Well, well, Bill, I, 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 I agree. Oh, go ahead, Alvin. I, I agree with you in that um, one of the things that's hard to, exactly to explain is that any generation... Of, of, of black families, the generation that had it before you had it worse than you did, okay? Now, we're in a watershed moment. Why? Because of, of phone cams and video and 24-hour news cycle and whatnot. This could have gone on 20 years ago, and we could have read about it, or people could have testified it happened, but nobody would have believed it. You know, they would have said the gentleman choked himself to death. You know, so... um. You know, but I agree with you. That being said, you know, it's time for a change and people are feeling it because people saw it. And I think if you didn't see it, and that was true in the 60s, people didn't believe it was as bad in the South until they saw Bull Connor blasting people right. with fire hoses and little children in jail and all that. You know, so that's part of it. But you're absolutely right. We're better now than we were in the 60s or the 50s or beyond that. But the, the question is, where do we go from here? But I agree with I you, Bill. I think Thank the you. interesting thing about 2020, well, first of all, I want to say, I sort of defer to Bill because he's, you know, much older and really more experienced. <laughs> well, just keep deferring to me, Ray. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I don't really have anything else to say. I think the interesting thing about 2020, Bill mentioned 68. There are certain 
years that are remembered by their number that we think about. And I, I think of like, you think of uh, 1929 and 1968, perhaps 2001 with the World Trade Center. There really aren't many that you say, that was the year 68 and 29 are the two that come to mind. Yeah. And I really believe 2020 is gonna be one of those. But the stunning thing about 2020 with as much as has happened is we're not even halfway through it. And we mm -hmm. really have no idea where it's going to go. I mean, oh, we boy. just, well, I, I, it's going to be one of those years, like 68 and 29. And it's like, you got to pull up some popcorn, get some popcorn, because we, think about how much has happened since January 1st between the impeachment, the, the, the COVID-19 and the- what Yeah, no kidding. Now. No and kidding. we're not even and halfway just, What do you say, Wendy? And it's just June 4th. Um, I, I think that, first of all, what this episode has, has, you know, I think really driven home is as Americans, we lull ourselves into this false sense of security about all racism being contained south of the Mason Dixon line. And when I was growing up, I remember the Boston protests over the DSEG, mm -hmm. you know, and that was in the early 70s. And and I thought, but wait a minute, that's in the North. They, there's no racism in the North. And so this is, you know, really educated all of us about the fact that that we, in every state, in every city, in every county, we have to have some really honest conversations from both sides, from all sides of this. And what I will remember is in the wake of Michael Brown and all of the efforts that have gone into community policing and police really doing everything they can, so many of them to be part of the community, to create that comfort level, to see the protesters being, you know, where the where the police were kneeling before the protesters or high-fiving or fist bump or fist, you know, whatever it's called. I'm old too, Bill. But, you know, fist pumping the police officers and the protesters, that was the most encouraging thing I've seen so far. Well, the only thing I would add to that is I think that does happen more often than those of us in the media uh, proclaim or share. I mean, I was at an event this past November or maybe October with the chief of police, Judge Jimmy Everts, public safety director, uh, a women's group that was trying to battle African-American breast cancer, along with the Teamsters, and we were raising funds and handing out free items and, you know, didn't get much press co coverage. And, you know, there have been so many different programs with Jerry Layshock, the lieutenant, starting a basketball program with the kids, and then Sam Dotson and others had ice cream for the youth. And there, there's been a lot of really good fist bumps through the last, I'd say, six years, but they don't get reported. Well, I think but not it, in the it gets overshadowed. Murder, and, 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 and it is kind of brave. And I don't mean levity because that's too strong a word. But I read a, somebody had said something online. It had everything just crazy that has happened since the first of the year. And then it had dot, 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 um, lion walks out of Oakland Zoo because it's like a lion <laughs> escape. And then it said, like, 2020 is officially drunk. So maybe we'll sober up between now and, mm -hmm. and the end of the year. But it's well, just been that kind of Charlie, year. this uh, thing, uh, I, can I say one other thing to Alvin's point is it feels like we're living at a time, and I don't know if it's because of 24-7 news or what it is, that every day there are two or three stories that would be like the story of any other year. I mean, it's like, and we get, they get blurred together and we don't just get specific, but every day there's a, just a, a ginormous bombshell story that, that may not even be the top story of that day that would have been a huge story any other time. It's a well, very strange Well, it's true. Time. You know, uh, Maureen Dowd of the New York Times once was a White House correspondent during the President George Herbert Walker Bush years. And she said when she covered it, there were so few news stories nothing was happened that they had to really write features on the presidential dog. And, uh, you know, today, you're right, there's three or four bombshells an hour, it seems. But, Ray, one of the bombshells came out yesterday, we think, when the Attorney General for the state of Missouri, Eric Schmidt, said that of the 36 arrests in the city of St. Louis, mostly among looters and thieves, the circuit attorney turned them all away. Well, she responded to that, didn't exactly say she was turning them away, but she didn't either say, uh, she didn't say, hey, I'm working with the police to uh, prosecute these looters. What do you know about this? And by the way, she's going to be on your show tonight at 9 o'clock, I believe. She is. Uh, well, first of all, what I read Eric Schmidt said, unless he was misquoted, is she let them back out on the streets, is what was reported. 
And I think Eric Schmidt should be better than this. I think it was, I don't know, despicable, uh, irresponsible. Um, if people want to, as far as Kim Gardner goes, there's an election in August if people want to change circuit attorneys. But Eric Schmidt, even though he hasn't been a prosecuting attorney, knows better than this. And, and the average citizen might not know. Prosecutors don't let people out of jail, first of all. There were 36 cases. As, as of yesterday, when he made his comment, the police had only brought evidence to her in eight of them. Okay? Two of them she had charged. And the judge made it not to, she's not a judge. The judge let them go on bail. Understand, you can only keep people 24 hours without a charge. Right. I mean, without a prosecutor moving forward. So she, according to her, and we'll see if it's true, only eight of them she could have even charged. And she did decide six of them didn't have enough evidence. Her job as a prosecutor is to decide whether there's enough reasonable cause to proceed with the charge. Well, well, well Ray, if, 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 I, if I could stop you for a minute, you know, prosecutors might not let anybody out, but prosecutors make the decision whether to prosecute or not. And at a time when the, when the police were out there and, and making arrests and, and, you know, we talk about the big picture, all the peaceful protesters, but it's hard to keep the big picture in mind when the little picture is shooting at you. And we had three police officers shot and when they, they do make arrests and we have a circuit attorney who's anti-police and who m makes a decision not to prosecute anybody that's that, that's wrong i think i but have to say the, other day, the press conference with jimmy edwards and chief hayden and lida Cruzen and and kim gardner and i'm sure i'm forgetting somebody she seemed very impassioned, Bill, and I mean, she made it sound as if sure there are going to be there are going to be bumps in the road between her office and the police. But she was emphatic, absolutely emphatic, that she would not tolerate that she would use the full weight of her office to get anybody who shoots at a police officer, who harms a police officer, or anybody else in the community. She has three years to file charges and, and in, a, in a YouTube video that she released in the aftermath of Schmidt part three, she said that, um, you know, that she has been insured by the Metropolitan, assured by the Metropolitan Police Department that, that as soon as they have significant substantial evidence that, that they will, that they will get it to her. So it sounded, it sounded to me like there was some grandstanding going on, but it wasn't Kim Gardner. Well, I, I, I think if you, I'm sorry, Alvin, you go ahead. Eric Schmidt has nothing to do with the Saint, city of St. Louis other than running his mouth. People, it's a predominantly Democratic city, and he has nothing to do. Eric Schmidt, whatever he says, let's be ignored. But what I have is I have a dead black man who was murdered during this mayhem who's there trying to protect the store of a friend of his. And if I'm Kim Gardner, nobody's going anyplace until I talk to every individual one and i would start with the 17 year old and said let me let me tell you guys something i got a murder that i don't know who committed and i got police officers shot that i don't know who committed all 36 of y'all look good for every one of those crimes right now and somebody better tell me something before anybody goes anywhere i'll charge every last one of you with conspiracy to commit murder until well, that's I prosecutorial abuse. I Alvin, that's just as bad no, as not. what the protesters no, complain about. Wasn't no, Daniel Dorn to what, lean on somebody and say, Dorn, you know, I, I, I think it's unrealistic. To, I, I, I know what you're saying. I think it's unrealistic to be threatening these people with unrelated crimes. If you were there, to keep if some you were, order on the street, you can't just let everybody go and say, well, actually, I'm not letting anybody go with the judges. You got to be willing to prosecute somebody just to keep them in jail for the next night. Was he murdered? I thought I thought Chief Dorn. I thought Chief Dorn was killed in the county. He was killed in Ferguson, so he wasn't killed in St. Louis. I, I'm just saying yeah, that. Alvin wasn't saying no, that. No, wait, wait, Alvin. You I'm are not saying, saying that. What I'm saying is, is that listen. I want some answers, and I want them Alvin, right now. There's it, thousands Alvin, the of people city, out among if, the city. Someone could have been at the 7-Eleven and arrested there and nowhere near Lee's Pawn Shop. It's unreasonable. Okay. And right. what, it's what you're talking person. about is you're almost making fake confessions. No, I'm, what I'm saying is, is that, hey, look, we got 
officers shot. I got a man murdered here. Everybody's oh, out. Right. Everybody's four police here. officers. Four police officers, okay? Right. What am I supposed to do? That man, that guy had even probably been properly, he was at the at the morgue, not even at the funeral home. I, okay. And this is okay? This is okay with everybody to just let all these people go. No, no, Alvin, you get, you're missing the process. First of all, it's the police that invent, would be investigating and questioning, and I have no problem. None of all of us have the same, you know, disgust for looting and vandalism. The point is this: it would be the police that interview suspects, not the prosecutor. The prosecutor's job is to take evidence from the police and decide if he or she understand can bring charges. That, but, and, and Eric Schmidt... So, so if they want to say... But wait, and, and if Kim they want to say to her... did not you know, have the ability right. well, to well, do but, Ray, that. if you have so much disgust for the looters... I do. Why, why do you think that... How, how come nobody was charged? I would like... Nobody the question was I would have, I, My question is, to the police department, is why is... According and again, maybe is well, a fact question. Why was were there thirty six looters? I would like to think that the police would have brought evidence about well, Ray. Uh, don't you understand? Uh, she doesn't. Ray, she doesn't trust the police work. I, no, I. That's I'm the just evidence saying, that she I don't, rejects. I haven't. What, what seen are you looking for? Back. Fingerprints. I. I mean, they, seriously, they, what, you must be looking for a photo her, or something. They haven't brought her enough evidence to bring forward the charges. Well, I don't it's, know. Very, it's very hard to gather all of this evidence. You don't have to have all of it. On the streets, right? Bill, say, according to her, they didn't bring any evidence to her, is my point. I don't know if she's who's telling the truth. Well, I mean, they, well, shouldn't, they shouldn't bother arresting people. Then, no, they, but Bill, she's saying, give me the evidence. And I, my question is, if she's telling the truth, then the question is to the police department well, in this town. Ray, as to why an aren't you eyewitness account evidence? by a police officer could be considered evidence. What? An eyewitness account by a police officer could be evidence. And again, I think it's fair to look, and, and here's the deal. Okay. If you, all, all right. right. Enough, enough on this. We'll, we'll listen to her your interview for tonight. The voters Nine o'clock to tonight on off. KTRS. Okay. Bill McClellan, uh, I'm sorry, Wendy Weiss. Um, Alvin Reed brought up the tragic loss of Captain Dave Dorn, who later was Chief Dave Dorn of Moline Acres. Uh, I think we all know the story now. He was an off duty security guard responding to a break in at Lee's pawn shop. He was shot and killed. There was a memorial walk for him today. Kevin Colleen of KMWX Radio reported that it wasn't very well attended. Nonetheless, in his final minutes, uh, someone with a camera captured him on Facebook Live as he was lying on the ground, blood on the ground, a revolver in one hand, and nobody really coming up to help him. One passerby actually picked up the revolver and ran with it and didn't stop and pray with the man or anything while he was in his labored breathing and his eyes were open. But let me say this. I think a video like that should not be on Twitter or Facebook. What are your thoughts? Well, it, I, I was kind of stunned by Facebook's position, which was that it didn't, and I'm paraphrasing, it didn't violate companies' standards of graphic what whatever a, a graphic content excuse me and i thought to myself if that doesn't violate facebook's standards of graphic content what would i agree what would and it violates every standard of human decency and according to i mean because at, at the dictates of my faith teach me that that is a sacred moment when that man, that hero's soul left his body, that that is a sacred moment. To, to think that that is being exploited for, you know, really just vile interests. And, you know, Facebook's attitude is, well, you know, maybe it'll help a dialogue. I don't think his family would see it that way. I just don't think his family want their beloved patriarch to be used, you know, for chatter in a social on a social media platform i, I, I just it, it really scares me for the future it truly i does. agree with wendy a hundred percent well said i think facebook standards and like four quarters will get you something at the dollar store mm. i mean facebook standards are a joke and and i i just think it's i mean unless there's something in that video that would somehow help identify the perpetrators 
and then that's a different issue. I didn't, fortunately for me, I didn't see it. But if it's just watching this poor man's last minutes, um, I, I, I don't see that, um, you know, that having, and that's very different than what we watched mm -hmm. with um, George Floyd, which was sort of evidentiary. But, but in terms of this, I, I agree with Wendy. All right. Well, it just seems like, all right, um, once again, that was horrific But um, to watch it, but somebody shot it. And I'm talking about all means necessary, be you in the city, be you in the county, you're in the metropolitan area. How about we find out who, who murdered the guy and shouldn't that be a bigger concern than well, Facebook? It, exactly so. I totally agree. But getting people to come forward and um, drop a dime on murder suspects is hard to do in the city I realize of St. Louis that, but I'm, that's what I'm reasons. saying. We're, we're letting people go that were out there on that night. How about we try to squeeze them? I don't care where they were at. You got arrested on the wrong night because this guy got killed on Facebook. Okay? And it's all out there. I'm sorry. Nobody goes anywhere. This is a time to be tough on crime. And people who aren't committing crimes, leave them alone. They can protest peacefully. But those well, don't that you do think, though, largely speaking, that the very rife and ubiquitous crime on the streets is almost ignored? I mean, in comparison to some of the cases of police brutality. Well, yeah, well, uh, I was in that. I could choke somebody to death and basically say, you know, we had a tip or whatever happened and, and not be charged as heavily as some other crime. I agree with that, Charlie, but under the nature of rioting and looting and, and things like that, and then somebody ends up dead, that's, I'm not saying it's a more mm. serious crime, but that's oh. a crime that needs to be Charlie, dealt with immediately. Charlie, I do think it's important you talk about I don't want to talk about my show all night, but Lacey Clay was on my show and was talking about... Mine, it too. Good. It was yeah. a Captain Dorm. Dorm is and we had the Pope on also on my show. Did we, you hear I that? don't compete with you, but Cap was, was a chief a, most recently. He was a chief in Moneymakers. After years all, with the All I want to say is he was emotional a about what a great man this was. And a but, lot yeah. of folks feel the same. Hey, um, Elvin, let me get back to you for a moment because it was a week ago on this program that we were excoriating those who are at the Lake of the Ozarks without masks on and how they were killing people. I mean, that's they, that's what they were doing by not socially distancing at the Lake of the Ozarks, Coconut Grove, or whatever we call it. But now, many of the nonviolent protesters are wearing masks, but many are not. And here we are, no longer socially distancing and not wearing masks in many cases. This week, uh, could it be said that those in the streets in 140 American cities are also killing their grandmothers? Yes, it could be said. I will say that the measures that have, have brought this on are different than splashing around in the pool in the Lake of the Ozarks. Uh, yeah, you should have a mask on, but quite frankly, um, you know, this is a different time, obviously. And I, 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 I just think that that's, you know... Charlie. Do you, do you really believe and I do you really believe that before he picks up his Molotov cocktail, the kid <laughs> on the street is going to say, oh, wait a minute, County Executive Page said that I should be wearing my face mask and socially. That's not going to happen. I just I mean, that's they have continued to put out that 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 warning from County Executive Page to Lida Cruson to uh, the doctors at the national level. They've all said if you're protesting, which sounds kind of ridiculous, if you're you're protesting that you're going to pick up your rocks and your mask, or you're if you're rioting, you know there, it's just I just think but, it's kind of but Wendy, silly to last expect. week, last week Wendy, you were saying basically that you know you wouldn't want to give someone cancer, right? And why would you want to give someone coronavirus? And I was saying uh, the the whole point of last week was not to accuse people of trying to murder other people. Really? It was it, it was ex no, it was explaining why we wear the mask to protect those who are vulnerable, people who are fighting cancer, like you know some of the people that we love, and you know people who have all sorts of compromised immune systems. That's what this was about. It was not about saying you're killing people. It was just, you know, I, I think there's this these lines in the sand 
you know, if you're if you're if you're of these political stripes, if you have these political stripes, you're going to wear a mask. If you don't wear a mask, then you have these political stripes. It's all ridiculous. But Charlie, and, you know, I, I thought from what I could see that the the daytime protesters, just just like in Ferguson, that's it's a different group of people. I mean, the the problems come when the night shift comes on, and those are kids just they're looking for mischief or worse adventure and. They're not going to wear masks, but in the daytime, there were a lot of people I saw who were trying yeah. to be. Well, they know, were. On Correct. Saturday, I only man. got two minutes to go. Carly, uh, can I say ask, something real quick about this? Ray, I, because Charlie. we're going to get to uh, Bill about uh, Ella Jones. The new mayor of Ferguson is Ella Jones, first black female elected to that position. Bill, what's your takeaway? And we've got about two two minutes to go. Two minute warning, everybody. Well, my thing, well, I, I thought it was fine. I mean, I I didn't pay a lot of attention to the Ferguson election. And I don't want, know what the issues were, but uh, I wish you well. I agree. I, w I was very disappointed that Knowles was reelected um, four years ago. I don't know if the dynamic of the city has changed uh, or, or what has changed over the last four years. Um, you know, congratulations to her. But, but you know how everything is getting lost in another story? We were talking about that earlier. Her election is totally lost on what's going on. Uh, in the St. Louis area right now. I so. think it. I think it was symbolically a nice thing. I think it's. She's got a very difficult job, and um, it's nice symbolism. I did want to say one thing, Charlie. We won't know on COVID yet what happened out of the lake. It takes four to six weeks for us to even know what the consequences. I, I think that's is. true. We're in the first inning, maybe your second inning. But I would disagree with you respectfully, Alvin. I think James Knowles did a great job in Ferguson. I think it's a great place to live. Oh, and wait a minute. Hold it. Let me, let me finish most... what I was saying. My disappointment was there was all this ruckus among the African-American citizens all around Ferguson, but it seemed like the African-American citizens in Ferguson didn't even bother to vote the last time. I'm not. I'm, I'm really not even disparaging his character. Yeah. I'm just saying for all the noise that was made between 2014 and uh, you know that election four years ago. Well, what, what come up? What good enough? Up? I'll tell you what. Um, Mike McMillan has an office in Ferguson now because that's where the Urban League is. It's on uh, West Florissant Road. In fact, in si the site of the old Quick Trip. Yep. We're going to talk to him, the president of the Urban League, in just a moment. So stay with us, won't you? Donnybrook is made possible by the members of the Nine Network. Donnybrook is made possible by the members of the Nine Network. Thanks for joining us for Donnybrook Part 2, where we put a leader from the community on the hot seat. And tonight, he's Michael McMillan, the president and the CEO of the Urban League of Metropolitan St. Louis, whose offices are now in uh, Ferguson. We were just talking about that on West Florissant Road, the side of the old Quick Trip. Uh, and uh, Mr. McMillan has been getting some attention, but I don't think enough recently for the outstanding work that he's been doing along with others to distribute food during the pandemic. And uh, Mike, welcome to Donnybrook part two. We really appreciate not only you joining us for this episode, but also for the great work you're doing in the community. From what I've seen, the miles of those lined up to receive food and other items seem to be like miles long. Uh, can you give us some idea of what kind of work you've been doing this spring? Well, as you know, there is an enormous need in the community in terms of individuals that have lost their jobs, they've lost hope, they've lost all of their economic security that they just had a couple months ago. So we started to receive enormous amounts of calls and texts and emails into the office asking for food, for toiletries, for diapers, for formula, for rental assistance, mortgage assistance, utility assistance, and just basic things that people need to survive. And so we decided, quite frankly, that we could not give away all of these items in the traditional way that we used to at the outreach centers. So we created these large weekly distributions to try to service the need. The first one we did at our Jennings Station Road location that is actually a former schnooks. 
We served 1,075 families and sadly had to turn away 100 people. And like you said, if you know where that is, basically by New Halls Ferry, the line down Jennings Station Road went all the way to Highway 70. And then in the other direction, it went all the way into the city of St. Louis down 367. So it just showed an enormous amount of need. And as we continue to do these, we then moved from Jennings to North St. Louis, then to East St. Louis, to Alton, to Madison, and then to North County. And each week they just grew and grew and grew to the point that the last time we were at the old Jamestown Mall, we gave away 3,958 of these boxes that we have been making thanks to the generosity of so many individuals, companies, organizations, and now the St. Louis County government as well. And it just shows that the need is overwhelming, that it's going to be here for a long time because wow. there are so many of our St. Louis neighbors who are in need. And quite frankly, we give them as much as we can, but we know that it's not even enough. And so we're going to do this at least until August so that we can then help with back to school. And then wow. we'll assess where we are then in terms of what we'll do between that moment and the end of the year. Mike, I've been to the new um, facility there on West Florissant. The St. Louis Blues had uh, a, a deal there um, right before the All-Star game. And it's just, it's fantastic. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you. you know, what you probably found out uh, here in the last weeks is that there are people coming to you seeking, seeking help, seeking materials that basically never really thought much about an urban league at all and, and, and different races and, and different cultures from different communities. Um, you know, as you look out and you're doing this, what have you learned that, that are we one community? We say that all the time, but maybe in times like this, are you finding out that really we truly are? Well, I think a few things. One, 75% of the people that have gone through the lines in the past two months have told us that they have never, ever been through a food line in their entire lives. And so you're looking at individuals that recently had jobs. Many of them we actually know. I mean, I've seen people that I know that work at the airport that lost their job, people that work at the convention center, hotels, downtown, restaurants, shopping malls, and so many industries where they have not only been closed, but in some cases, they won't reopen. So they don't even have a job to go back to. And as you mentioned, it's really been a little United Nations in terms of the ethnicities and the races that have gone through in the ages. So you have black, you have white, you have Latino, you have Asian, you have some of everyone coming together to receive these items in the community. And then even more so than that, we have an enormous need, obviously, but you wouldn't be able to do anything about the need if people didn't give some resources of their own treasure, their own capacity to give. And so in the past couple of months, we've been running these PSAs on various TV stations and social media and you have about 500 plus St. Louisans that have donated anything from $10 up to $5,000 to help us to be able to do this on top of many different companies that have lost profits, have lost income themselves, individuals who have had significant losses. But because St. Louis is one of the most generous regions in the entire country, we've been able to give away literally over a million dollars worth of food, toiletries, masks, gloves, and sanitizer. And we definitely want to continue that focus on the PPE materials as well, because the zip codes that we're doing these distributions in are the highest concentrations of where the disease has had the biggest impact, specifically in the African-American community. Uh, Mike, uh, first of all, congratulations on the wonderful work you're doing. And it's uplifting on one hand to hear that we are coming together as a community. And I know we have, not only your organization, through others, it really has been a, a sense of community spirit. But I see the word empowerment on the sign behind you. Um, going forward, when we get on the other side of this nightmare, what do you see us needing to do to have the same sort of diverse and unified effort on the subject of empowerment? So obviously, like you mentioned, Ray, you know, we did not plan on doing this. No one planned for COVID and none of us want to 
spend these resources just giving out food. We would love to be able to help utilize all of the funds and the time, the effort, the energy, and all of the work that we have been doing to help people to find jobs. Because the goal is really not to have them come through the food line every week. The goal is to give them the ability to be independent and take care of themselves and their families. So we've had to pivot, of course, just like every other organization, just like the show that I've been watching my entire life now that, of course, it's virtual. So we've been doing virtual job fairs, you know, trying to place people in industries that are still hiring with companies like Schnucks and Walmart and Amazon and Instacart and places where individuals can go get employment now and they can have some type of hope and opportunity. A lot of individuals are going to have to retool their skills. They're going to have to learn new skills. They even have to go back to school and get additional certifications and things of that nature. So I think that, you know, the goal is financial independence. In the meantime, though, we want to be there for the community and give them the basic needs that they need at this very precise, significant moment so that they can survive. And then after that, that they can become independent again. Mike, we have heard certainly this week and, and the unemployment numbers always come out on, on Thursday and, you know, Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is when we get the roundup of, of nationwide unemployment numbers. And we're getting, you know, kind of perilously close to depression era numbers. As somebody who is, is facing this Herculean task every single day, what do you focus on? How do you stay optimistic for the many, many people and organizations and small business owners who look to you for help and sunshine where they see a thundercloud? You know, I mean, if you add in the health crisis from the pandemic that also showed all of the health disparities, specifically in black and brown communities, and when you then look at the economic crisis that has come about as a result of it, and then obviously there's the racial crisis that has been added after the death of Mr. Floyd. And all of these things at once can definitely make you become depressed if you really let it. But I think that luckily, you know, we have a great staff, a great team, a great board, and some great people in this community that we rely on. And we let the optimism, you know, just really kind of quite frankly grow from each other how we work to solve these problems and how we want to come together as a community and we feed off of each other's positive energy because any one of these things quite frankly could be depressing by itself but when you look at it as a collective it could really be depressing but that's when the community needs us the most and those of us that are native st louisans that we've lived here all our lives or those of us that have adopted St. Louis as a home here in this community know this is a great town. It's a great region. It's worth fighting for. It's someplace that we all need to make the best region it can be. So we're going to do everything we can to be a part of that because, in my opinion, we have no other choice. We have to make St. Louis the best thing be, Missouri and the country. Mike, uh, in a way, you're still a politician, but I'll call you a former politician, okay? <laughs> that, that was and, and, you so know, long ago, Alvin. So <laughs> <laughs> I remember it like it was yesterday. It was so long ago. So long ago. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, and, and I, won't, I, I won't pin it down to like mayor of the city of St. Louis or county executive, but let, let's say you were either or. Um, what, what, from your aspect is now, you know, directing the Urban League, if you could tell them, like, hey, if there was one thing, County Executive Page, or one thing, uh, Mayor Lida Cruzan, I would ask you to do, what would that be? Well, I think that when you look at our government leadership, from the mayor to the county executive to the federal level to the state, et cetera, I mean, the reality is people are hurting, and they need their government. Now, luckily, we've been able to pass these stimulus packages and put some relief into the hands of the people that need it the most. But what I would say is that this is going to be a marathon, not just a sprint. So right now, you know, we've been able to help and we've been able to do some things, but do not think by any stretch of the imagination that this economy is just going to bounce back and everything is going to go back to normal. And especially keep in mind helping the least of these, the individuals that really didn't have any resources at all in the first place. The clients that we serve that only had a $15,000 annual income, the working poor, 
who don't even have $400 in the bank to deal with any type of emergency that might arise at any given moment that the rest of us have been blessed to be able to take care of. But for individuals like that, quite frankly, are devastating. Please keep the working poor and those individuals that need our help the most in this community at the forefront of your agenda and realize that it's not going to be a quick fix, that it's going to be a long haul. That would be my request to them. Follow up on that because I don't know the answer. Are you eligible for any kind of governmental support at this time or is a not for profit? You could only like maybe pay your employees, but 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 there's no governmental entity that can help you provide uh, food, diapers, these other things that you mentioned. So we did apply for the PPP program and we were approved and we did receive that funding. Very good. Uh, as did uh, many, many urban leads across the country. And in the COVID relief funding that came through St. Louis County, uh, we were recently granted a $500,000 allocation from Dr. Page to deal with food and toiletries and PPE materials in our county distributions. So each municipality has their own application process. We also have an application into the city and we have an application in for our work in Illinois as well. And we're very hopeful that the city of Illinois will join in to help us to be able to continue these all the way through August. And then we know we will do some additional ones in let's say October, November, December, just working through the logistics of all of that and the expense because as you know, when I said we went from 1,075 people to 3,900 plus, that, that means the expenses have grown drastically. So at some weeks, we have actually spent and gotten donated items up to $200,000 worth just in that one particular week of distributions. Mike, besides giving money, what can a citizen of goodwill do right now? I mean, we've got all these people on the streets saying we need change and there's systematic racism. But, but as an individual, what can a person do? You know, I think there are several things that people can do. Uh, so first of all, I would say participate in the upcoming election. So when you have the opportunity to voice your vote, if you want to end systemic racism, if you want to be about change, if you want to empower individuals that want to do the same thing on a city, state, and federal basis, when the election comes up, you should vote. And I think we just had an example this week to show how historic St. Louis can be in terms of change. So when you look at Ella Jones's election, so here was the first African-American female member of the city council in Ferguson, and that has now become the first African-American mayor of this city that has been through so much and was a poster child and remains a poster child for racial injustice and inappropriate police community relations. Here she is, the first African-American mayor in 126 years. And then in that same community, you had a fellow member of the city council. And this is a small city of only a little bit over 20,000 people. But Wesley Bell, of course, as we all recall, was on the city council there. So he went from being a private citizen to a member of that city council to then becoming the prosecutor for the largest county in the state of Missouri with a million people as the first African-American. And when the Michael Brown incident first happened, in the 120-year history of the Ferguson Police Department, the highest ranking officer at that time was a sergeant in the police force of African-American descent. And so now you have an African-American police chief. And so we've had majority of the city council. You've had the judge turned over, the clerk turned over. You had the city manager turned over. So when you look at the power of the vote and how you can express yourself at the ballot box, that is something that's very important. Another thing I would tell everyone, and I'm sure you've talked about it on many of the issues in the past several months, make sure that you participate in the census. Those of us that watched it and saw what happened the last time know that we lost a whole congressional district because of population loss in Missouri the last time we had a census. And that meant that we lost tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funding in terms of what we did as a state in terms of participating in the census and keeping up with the national trends with the census. And then in addition to that, you know, individuals that don't have the ability to donate and are also economically devastated by what is happening. 
you can come volunteer with us and you can come volunteer with so many different organizations that are out here on the front lines, making a difference, helping others, giving back and trying to be the best version of St. Louis. Every single Saturday, we have about 250 volunteers that look like a little United Nations, black, white, young, old, rich, poor, gay, straight, everyone working together for a common cause in this community to make St. Louis the best region it could be. Hey, Mike, um, did I, a uh, two-part question. Number one, did I hear you say, did I hear you correctly that you have been watching Donnybrook your whole life? Is that possible? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Okay, I knew I liked you. And by the way, yesterday would have been our founder, Martin, Duger, uh, Martin Dugan's 99th birthday. So uh, we uh, gone but not forgotten for sure. Yes. The, the, the other question, you're over there on uh, West Florissant, which was really the site of most of the civil unrest in 2014. And it really hasn't come back great guns yet. I know that the Economic Development Partnership under Sheila Sweeney was supposed to renovate all of it up and down. And, you know, if we have civil unrest in 2017 and then again in 2020, are businesses really going to be incentivized to go into some of our hardest hit areas and invest money? Well, I think the, the answer simply is, in many cases, no. And you can tell that by what has happened over the course of time. So sadly, when you look at Ferguson today and you look at what happened when Michael Brown died and then you looked at the 17 different buildings that were burned to the ground in the course of everything that happened, the Quick Trip was the first one that was burned to the ground the day after he died. That is where we have our community empowerment center that we own with the Salvation Army that has the Lutheran Church and the University of Missouri Extension program in there with the SBA. But sadly, you still see too many vacant, abandoned, derelict lots where there were one-time businesses with economic vitality, jobs, and hope and resources that people could actually go utilize in their community. And, you know, Alvin mentioned it earlier in terms of me having had the privilege of being an elected official many years ago, and I was the alderman for Channel 9 in the area to the north. And I can tell you as an alderman and somebody that lived in that neighborhood and worked in that neighborhood, it is very, very difficult to lure private investment into low to moderate income communities and to build at a scale where people feel comfortable doing that. So sadly, the civil unrest where you have opportunistic looters and you have antagonists that come into the community, you have anarchists that come in and destroy property, that doesn't help anybody. It takes away from the conversation about police brutality. It takes away from the conversation about better police community relations and justice. It takes away from the conversation about racial equity, how we need to move forward as a region and a country. So it isn't helping anybody, and it has a very negative impact, especially in the areas that really cannot afford to have it happen. But it's not just there. I mean, if you look at retail in this country, there are no malls under construction in the United States. And so malls have gone through a lot as well. And we, every other week almost, end up going to a closed-down mall at Jamestown to organize these large distributions. And, you know, we need to work on a way so that we can have peaceful protests that can be separate and apart from and be concluded in a way that they are very identifiable from what is happening in the evening after the fact with people looting and robbing and stealing. Because the two things are totally separate, but they sometimes get bunched together because of the fact that they're happening on the same days and it looks like they're all part of a big collective effort, but they are not. And, uh, and I'm so glad that you, you made that, that point, Mike, because as Ray has pointed out several times this week, when we all saw the photographs, the video of George Floyd and the nine minutes that, that he suffered, even the anchors on Fox News were denouncing what had happened, were calling for you know, the, the, the convictions it, it, it absolutely immediately. And yet, and maybe I spend too much time on social media, but maybe it's just a, a, an age, a demographic thing. But 
I get the sense from a lot of younger people on social media of all colors that we're not supposed to denounce the violent protesters. And I've seen my black friends, I've seen my, I mean, people of, of all colors are, are, are denouncing it, but they're basically shouted down and told, you know, hey, that's part of it. Can you help us here before we all retreat back into our silos and turtle shells? Absolutely. I mean, I think that this particular case in the killing of Mr. Floyd was so egregious, was so ridiculous, was so reprehensible, where an officer of the law who is paid to protect the citizens of his community actually executed one of his citizens on camera, and he knew what was happening. But he was so incredibly cavalier in what he was doing because he felt he could get away with it obviously based on who it was that he was killing. And it's my understanding that he has somewhere between 17 and 19 citations in his record. And that type of person and that type of background should not have been allowed to be continuing to serve the public, paid by taxpayers to represent them and instead murdering them. So I think there's so much outrage about that that is unilateral, like you said, that even Fox News has condemned it. Now, then when you look at the opposite, obviously, as a result of that, there is an enormous amount of rage, anger, disgust, resentment that happens as African-American people feel this pain. And it's a series of events. He's not the first person that has died at the hands of the police and the rest. So there is a legitimate pain and anger that we have as Americans to be brought to this place in the middle of a global pandemic. At the same time, as Dr. King would say more eloquently than any one of us could ever say, it is not appropriate to meet violence with violence because that just lets everyone get damaged and hurt and the rest. And it takes away from the legitimate elements of society that want to come together around police reform, around making sure that individuals have their rights and around justice. And so I think that we need to recognize Violence is not the answer for violence. Looting is not the answer for this anger. I understand the frustration and the rage, but you know, breaking into stores that are already barely surviving, that right. then would end up potentially closing and hurting the very communities that we are advocating to save. When you look at what happened in Ferguson, and you look at the vacant and abandoned derelict lots that used to have businesses, and here we are almost six years later, that is proof performance that low to moderate income communities that need this type of reinvestment in many cases won't get it because they will not have private investors and there's not enough government resource to come in and rebuild some institution. And so instead, you just have urban decay. We don't need urban decay in St. Louis. We don't need that in the inner city. We don't need it in the suburbs. We don't need it anywhere. We need growth, stability, and vitality. And I think that, you know, as we look at this, obviously we don't want to condemn the legitimate protesters. We want to support them. We want them to feel emboldened and enabled so that their voices are heard, their civil disobedience is recognized. But we don't need to condone and support violence and negativity because it's not helping Thank you. you. Less than two minutes. Mike, um, by the way, I think that was like my dad you saw in the early years of Donnybrook. I don't know if you grew up. <laughs> Um, but the, um, um, let me, I guess that would make me that. Anyway, um, what is the footprint of the Urban League? To, who do you serve? What, what geographically speak? So we serve St. Louis City, St. Louis County, and East St. Louis, St. Clair County with 15 different offices, with 50 different programs, 250 staff and 75 board members, which means that you don't know anybody that has more bosses than me, right? <laughs> and well, what about like not St. Charles and not beyond that? So if anyone comes to us that needs help, that we can help, we don't care where the boundaries are. There are some governmental programs that we administer that are specific by county and geography and income. But if you come through the lines to get food and right. toiletries and masks and gloves, you could come from another state and we would just let you go through. And the reason I asked that, and maybe it's a follow-up to what I was asking before, and it's not really meant as a political question. Obviously, people have come together through your organization across all lines, racial, ethnic, 
30 seconds to go, guys. What do we do to, to, to replicate that in the future for our community as we move forward? You know, I think that we have to recognize the fact that we're all in this together. We're all St. Louisans. We all share a common cause. We all share, share a same region. And that we, neighbors helping neighbors at this most difficult time in our entire lives, will show the best side of who and what we are as St. Louis. Mike McMillan, thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Donnybrook. Thanks for watching. Thanks for participating. And good luck to everybody at the Urban League of Metropolitan St. Louis. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week at this time. Thank you very much for joining us. Stay safe, stay calm, and thanks for keeping it on the Nine Network. Donnybrook is made possible by the members of the Nine Network.